All right, chapter seven, we're going to go over cognition and language. So we're going to go over um, how we think, how we break things down into ideas and concepts, uh, how we make decisions, things like that. And then we're also going to break down language and the development of language and um, how that occurs in our brains. So let's get into chapter seven. So first off, we're going to define what cognition is. Cognition are the mental activities associated with thinking, knowing, remembering, and communicating. And one way this occurs is through um, speaking in concepts or thinking in concepts, which are mental groupings of similar objects, events, and people. So if I were to say, what is a car? You probably have a mental picture in your head of a car, whether it's a sedan, an SUV, a truck, uh, anything, a crossover, anything in between. But really, if I were to write out what a car is, a car is a mechanical or an electrical vehicle that is used for the transportation of people. I don't have to write all of that. I can just say a car because we all know what a car is. It is a concept. A car is a concept. So we have a few different ways to break down uh, types of concepts. So first we've got formal concepts. These have um, rigid sets of rules or parameters for membership. So maybe a formal concept if we're talking about cars would be whether a vehicle is a diesel or not. We could we could put that into different categories. There's no if, ands, or buts. There's no, you know, combination. It's, is it a diesel or is it not? Or is it not? That is a formal concept. But a natural concept, um, that's a concept that develops through our own experiences in the world. So how do you know what color a car is? What if there are some cars that, um, th that's the color is kind of in between shades. I know there's some that kind of give off a greenish brown tint, depending on what uh, light, you know, whether sunlight's on it or not. A lot of darker vehicles look black when it's dark out, but whenever the sun's shining on it, you can see that it's maybe dark blue or dark green or, or dark brown, something like that. Um, but these are concepts we develop through our own experiences in the world. And then a prototype is a mental image or a typical example that exhibits all the features associated within a certain category. So what comes to mind whenever you think of a truck? Does... So, and so different people have different prototypes in my head. So if I say a truck is going to drive by in a little bit, what comes to your brain? What comes to your mind? Do you think of a semi? Do you think of a pickup? Do you think of a fire truck? Do you think of a big truck, a small truck, whatever it is? But that is a prototype that we have in our brains. And that could change depending on um, life experiences through through different things that uh, maybe your family owned a truck, so that's the kind that you think of, or maybe the only trucks you've ever seen are, um, you know, on TVs, and you think of the big super loaded trucks, or you think of a semi truck, or whatever it is, you think of, you know, truckers that are driving down the road, um, but that is the prototype that you have come up with in your head. So we have hierarchies of concepts. This is a method of classifying concepts that progresses from the super broad to the super narrow. So we have three different types of, we have three different levels of concepts within this hierarchy. Um, so we have the superordinate concepts. These are the broadest that include the most concepts. So if we're gonna continue along the line of cars, um, a superordinate concept would be just a vehicle, a vehicle that could be, a vehicle could be, any sort of thing that that transports people or things so that could be something such as um a type of a type of car um a bus an elevator um an escalator uh a plane you know vehicles could be so many different things so we need to break it down even further to the next level of in the hierarchy. This would be the basic concepts. So this level of concept provides significantly more specific information than the superordinate concepts. So that would be, so the superordinate would be vehicle, then basic concept would be a car. Then we get to the subordinate concepts, you know, another step up in the hierarchy of concepts. This is the most specific type of concepts that includes the narrowest category. So this could be a sedan. So you go from vehicle to car to sedan. That tells me what kind of car it is. Or if you want a different example, 
A superordinate could be food. A basic concept could be vegetable. And then a subordinate concept could be a carrot. We go from food to vegetable to carrot. It goes from broadest to most, um, to most narrow, to most specific. So I kind of have a flow chart right here, here. So we have vehicle, we have car, bus, truck. So different types of cars. We have sedan and sports cars. For buses, we have school and shuttle buses. And for trucks, we've got dump and trailer trucks. So if we go back to vehicle, if I just say vehicle, you have no idea what I'm talking about. If I say car or bus or truck, you have more of an idea. But then if I say sedan or sports car, you pretty much know what I'm talking about. Or school or shuttle bus, you know what I'm talking about. Or dump or trailer truck, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, a little bit of, rev of review for those first few slides. So blank are mental groupings of similar objects, events, and people. And that would be D, concepts. Number two, what type of concept develops through our experiences and has no rigid rules of classification? B, natural concept. Number three, which category of concepts is the broadest and contains very little specific information? C, superordinate concept. Number four, what is an example of a subordinate concept? D, Persian cat. Okay, now on to problem solving. This is a form of cognition where we are thinking through um, how to get from from beginning to end, how to take care of a problem. So problem solving is the act of combining current information with information stored in your memory to find a solution to a task. So uh, we need to go from what is the problem to the problem is taken care of. So the initial state um, is, is the state you're in during problem solving where there's an incomplete or unsatisfactory information. So it's saying what problem needs to be solved. That's what you're deciding in the initial state. You have a problem that needs to be solved. What is it? Um, but you don't have any information on how to get from point A to point B. So then we have the goal state. This is the state um, that you're working towards. This is this is um, where you have engaged in problem solving, where you have solved the problem. So goal is I have solved the problem. So how do we get from the initial state where is what problem needs to be solved to the goal state, I have solved the problem. That is the set of operations. These are the steps you need to take in problem solving to reach the goal state from the initial state. And so there are a few different ways um, that we can get from the initial state to the goal state. And one is through trial and error. So let's say for all of these, I want to bake a cake. Okay, so trial and error, this is the type of problem solving that involves trying a potential solution and discarding that option if it fails while moving on to the next potential solution. So um, maybe I'm coming up with a recipe in my head and I tweet and I, you know, say I'm baking a cake, I'm making a chocolate cake, I put all the ingredients together and it comes out and it's maybe a little flat, it doesn't didn't rise very much, and the flavor is kind of off, the texture is a little off, it's a little rubbery. So I tweak the ingredients the next time and it comes out, you know, maybe a little bit different, maybe a little bit better, but not perfect. And so I try and try again until I've got the perfect ratio of the perfect ingredients and now I've got the perfect cake. That could take two tries. It could take 10 tries. It could take a lot of tries. Um, so trial and error isn't always the most efficient way to solve a problem because it could take lots of um, lots of attempts. Like it say you're you have a a ring full of keys and trial and error to figure out which key unlocks the lock could take a long time. But if you have some kind of system, then you could figure out ways to make that go quicker, which would be um, potentially an algorithm. An algorithm is a step-by-step -step problem solving procedure that guarantees the ability to discover a solution to a particular problem. So in the realm of baking a cake, um, you could be following a recipe to a T. You could be following a recipe 100% step-by-step and you know you're going to come out with a great cake. Um, there's no questions. There's no, you don't really have to think hard about it. 
um, you're just following a step-by-step -step solution, a uh, procedure to come up with a solution. So baking a cake, I'm going to follow a recipe. I know exactly what to do. And if I do this the exact correct way, then I'm going to have my solution, which is a perfectly baked cake. Then we have heuristics. These are informal rules or mental shortcuts that make solving problems or decision-making quicker and simpler. These are, whether it's from past experiences or through, um, you know, so maybe something someone gave us that, that um, helps us through the process. So let's say we're baking a cake. Let's say I use a cake mix. I am foregoing several steps. It's a shortcut where I don't have to mix any of mix or measure any of the um, the dry ingredients together because it's already done for me. So I don't have to, I don't have to worry about that. All I have to worry about are the wet ingredients and not to say that it's foolproof. It's not foolproof. It's not an algorithm where it's a step-by-step -step procedure where it's going to pr provide a solution every time. This is a shortcut that um, may or may not work depending on what I do with the rest of the steps to get to the goal state. Okay, so now we've got the means end analysis. This is examining the difference between the initial state and the goal state in problem solving and then forming sub goals that will ultimately lead to the goal state. So um, let's say I have to bake a cake and the start, I've, I've got ingredients laid out and I've got a bowl and I've got a whisk and my goal state is to have a perfectly baked cake. So I'm going to break it down into sub goals that will lead to the goal state. So first I'm going to add the box mix to, or whatever dry ingredients to the bowl. Then I'm going to add the eggs the oil and the water, and I'm going to blend, okay? Then I'm going to grease and flour my pan. And then I'm going to, and so I have these, these steps that I need to take to get to the end goal, to get to the goal state. Or I could work backwards. Um, this is when you start at the goal state um, in, in, your, in your head, and then you work your way backwards to determine a solution to the problem. So if I'm working backwards and I'm baking a cake, I can say, okay, I've got in my, in my, my mind's eye, in my, in my brain, I've got this picture of a beautiful chocolate cake, which means I need cake batter, which means I need proper ingredients mixed at the correct ratios, which means I need to go to the store and get these ingredients for this cake. Okay. So I'm working backwards. I know what I want. What do I have to do in order to get to the goal state? Okay. And then sometimes we have insight. This is when a, a solution to a problem presents itself suddenly. So I want you to think of, I don't know if any of you guys have ever watched any of those cheesy Hallmark romantic movies or whatever, but whenever they're, or, or a romantic comedy of any sort where a woman is baking throughout, say she's baking cupcakes and they're just not quite right. No matter what she's doing, they're not quite right. Then at the end of the movie, she's like, oh, it was vanilla or it was love or whatever it is. That is insight. You automatically know what it was, what was, what piece was missing. You know, the solution to the problem because it presents itself suddenly, or maybe you're taking a test and you're, you know, you're, you skip a few questions because, okay, I've got to come back to it. I just, I can't, my brain can't process this right now. I can't work through the steps to get to the solution, which is the answer to this essay question. I just, I can't think through it, but then something sparks in your brain when you read it again, you know, you finish the, you finish the rest of the test, you come back to it and it's like, I've got the answer. I know exactly what it is. What is that? It's that spark in your brain that is insight. So we've got two different ways of thinking about a problem. We've got holistic thinking and we've got analytic thinking. So holistic thinking is focusing on the whole or how everything is connected. Um, how everything is an interconnectedness of systems and objects. Then we've got analytic thinking. This is breaking down a problem into multiple parts to find a solution. So we've got two opposite ways of coming to what we hope is the, the right solution. And 
One example I've got of this is through our healthcare system. Uh, we have some more holistic doctors and we've got what, you know, kind of general physicians or regular physicians. So a general physician is, you know, you, you go into the doctor because you're sick and, or you're not feeling well, and they treat the symptom. They treat the cough that you've got. But a holistic doctor is looking at your body as a whole and is saying, what is causing the cough? Um, is there something else that is connected to the cough in your lungs? Is it maybe coming from something in your diet? Is it maybe coming from some, some, something else in your body that needs attended, attention rather than here's an antibiotic for this cough, uh, take this for 10 days and you should be good to go. So we have a holistic thing. You're thinking of the body as a whole rather than um, different body parts, the lungs, the, the stomach, the spleen, the pancreas, the, the whatever it is, um, which would be more of analytic thinking, um, taking care of the symptoms rather than addressing the whole body. Okay. So sometimes we have some issues with problem solving. And this can happen through the act of fixation. This is the tendency to become entrenched in thinking a certain way, which leads to the inability to see a problem from a fresh perspective. So let's go back to baking a cake. Okay. So if I have a fixation, I could say, I can't bake a vegan cake. It must have eggs. There's absolutely no other way to bake a cake than with eggs. So I have this fixation because I've always... I've always learned and have always baked cakes with eggs that I, I don't know any other way to do it. Um, so I can't see now that, you know, a lot of people have gone vegan. I can't see this um, way to bake a cake. Say, you know, my friend is a vegan and I, and I was asked to bake a cake for her. And I think I can't do it because they're vegan and I can't, I can't do anything with cake without eggs. Um, so that is a fixation then a type of fixation is a mental mental set. This is a pre-existing state of mind used to solve problems because it helps solve similar problems in the past. So this is kind of like, say you're walking in the grocery store and your brain has automatically ignored, whether consciously or not, seeing vegan cake um, like mixes or seeing vegan cake recipes because you automatically believe that cakes have to be made with eggs. So it's you have this, this state of mind where you can't see solutions to the problem because you already know the solution to the problem you've got, which is I'm going to bake a cake that requires eggs. Okay. Then another type of fixation is functional fixedness. This is a bias that limits the ability to think about objects in unconventional ways. So because I know that cake requires eggs and so that can't be vegan um i don't think of using flax eggs which is where you combine uh flax seeds with water and let it set and it becomes kind of gelatinous like eggs and you can use it as an egg substitute in baking of any sort um but let's say i need to make this vegan cake and i've got flax seeds at home but I would never thinking of making flax eggs for this vegan cake because I only use them in my granola. I don't think of them as an egg substitute because why would I? That would be functional fixedness. It's a bias that limits the ability to think about objects in unconventional ways. I only think of flax seeds as something I mix in with like oats and chia seeds, maybe in a smoothie, maybe just in granola, um, you know, th things like that. I don't think it, of it as a vegan alternative for eggs. Why would I, why would I think of that? Okay. Now a little bit more review for those last few slides. So number one, when you are faced with the problem of needing to figure out how to feed 10 people with the food currently in your refrigerator, what is the initial state of the problem? That would be C, inventory of all the items in your refrigerator. Because how do you know what you can cook if you don't know what you've got in your refrigerator? So you need an inventory of all the items in your refrigerator. Number two, Max wants to bake a cake for his girlfriend for her birthday. He has never done this before, but he finds a recipe for a seven-layer chocolate cake and proceeds to follow the instructions step-by-step. 
This result is a wonderful cake that impresses his girlfriend. What problem solving strategy did Max use? A, algorithm. He finds a step-by-step -step recipe. Number three, the inability to see a problem from a different perspective is called what? B, fixation. Number four, an expert may become susceptible to this problem-solving difficulty because they are used to solving problems in the same way each time with success. What is this called? D, mental set. Okay, so now on to decision making. We do have to, um, whenever we are problem solving, we do have to make some decisions. Uh, so how do we come about those uh, those decisions? So first we've got judgment. This is a skill that allows people to form opinions, reach conclusions, and evaluate situations objectively and critically. And decision making is a process of selecting and rejecting a course of action from several available options. So it requires judgment to make a decision. So uh, what are some issues that can come about with making a decision um, or that something that can pose a problem when making a decision? So first we've got framing. This is a, a, a way, um, the way a decision or problem is presented to you, which can change the way that you approach making that decision. So if someone says, you know, advertises that something is 90% effective, well, that sounds a whole lot better than saying something is 10% non-effective or 10% defective. So you're going to, if someone's going to present a problem with you, they're going to present it probably in the most positive way, um, which would change your approach as if they, they presented it in the more negative way. So let's say, you know, we've got, we've got this thing that works 75% of the time. We need you to fix it rather than saying this thing fails 25% of the time. How do we, how do we fix it? That's going to change possibly the way that you, you approach it because Hey, 75%, that's pretty good. But if you think, Oh, 25% of the time it doesn't work, that's a really high percentage. So maybe I'm going to approach this in a completely different way than I would um, coming from the 25%. Or from the 75 percent okay um then we have sometimes we have decision aversion sometimes um we might become bombarded or overwhelmed with information or uh we we don't want the responsibility of making a decision and so we engage in decision aversion the state of attempting to avoid making any decision at all i feel like this happens the most with with my husband and i when we can't decide on what to eat for dinner. And I know a lot of people, <laughs> I know a lot of people um, face decision aversion when trying to figure out what are we going to have for dinner tonight? No one wants to make the decision. We avert it because we don't want to make the wrong decision. So we avert the decision and um, try to put it off on the other person. Uh, remember, we talked about heuristics just a few slides ago. So now we have two different types of heuristics we're going to talk about when trying to make a decision. So through the availability heuristic, this is a mental shortcut that tells us if we can bring examples of an event to mind easily, that event must be common. So if we're thinking about um, making a decision, um, maybe we're thinking about whether or not we're going to move somewhere, but I've seen on the news uh, some reports of crime that are happening there. Because I can recall it to my to my mind, then I think that that is something that is happening often. That is something that is common. So on the news, I'm hearing of robberies and murders, um, and because I can, you know, say I'm thinking about moving to Denver. Um, I live in in southeast Colorado right now. Let's say I want to make a move to the big city. But on the news, I'm seeing stuff about robberies and murders. And because I can recall that to my mind, examples of those events come to my mind easily. I believe that they're common. And so that's going to affect uh, my decision making on whether or not I want to move there to where in the city I want to move if I do end up moving. So that is an availability heuristic. And oftentimes, um, because of the news and because of the world of technology we live in, where we are inundated with so much information, 
it's very easy for us to overestimate the likelihood of these things occurring, such as crime. I'm not saying they don't happen or it's not on the rise in certain places, but because um, we are constantly um, shown examples of you know crime happening in certain places, uh, we are led to believe that is happening all the time, that it's much more common than it actually is, making us maybe afraid or changing the way that we view a certain place. And, and a lot of times it's on purpose. It's getting us to make a decision about whether it's gun control, whether it's moving somewhere, whether it, you know, it's trying to get us to make a decision about something. And that's it. They know exactly through the availability heuristic it affects our decision making. And if they show us um, what they want us to see, they know that they can also affect and influence our decision making. Okay. And not saying that gun control, you know, either way, but um, if someone wants you to believe in gun control or not believe in gun control, then they are going to show you information or give you examples, they're going to flash it on the screen to you. They're going to sh show lots of articles so that it easily comes to, my, to your mind what they want you to think. So just keep that in mind. Then we have the representative heuristic. This is solving problems or making decisions about the probability of an event under uncertainty by comparing it to our existing prototype of the event. So we talked about prototypes earlier, this, this image that we have in our head, kind of like an example. So let's say uh, you enroll in an English literature class and you've heard about Professor Smith who teaches this class. You've never seen this person. You don't know anything about this person, except you have a Professor Smith assigned to teach English literature. You hear they have a love for Jane Austen novels, which are kind of romantic um, female led books, novels written in like the 1800s. Um, and that, that professor also makes students crocheted bookmarks who do you picture in your head? What kind of person do you picture in your head? Are you thinking of maybe a woman in her 50s or 60s that wears glasses, that maybe has short graying hair, that wears scarves and cardigans? Um, that might be the kind of person that comes to mind. But would you be shocked if you walked into class for the first time and you saw a 35 to 40 year old male that also likes to lift weights and looks like he should be a sports coach? Would that shock you? Because that is an example of the representative heuristic that we have. It, it takes less effort to create pictures or concepts in our brains and using these prototypes we have, when you hear people that crochet and like Jane Austen and that it's an English literature professor, you think of someone completely different than who I just described as a younger man who is also into fitness. It just doesn't make sense from, that's not who anyone pretty much would automatically picture in their heads. So that can also affect your decision making. Another thing that can greatly affect your decision making is overconfidence, the tendency to think we are more knowledgeable or accurate in our judgments than we are. Um, that can prevent you from looking for more information, for asking for help, for um, getting any kind of outside resources. Because if you believe that you are knowledgeable or accurate in your judgment, then you think you can do it all yourself without any outside help or outside uh, resources. Sometimes we've got hindsight bias. This is our tendency to overestimate our previous knowledge of situations. So um, maybe the results have already come out about something. And even if you're wrong, you think, yeah, I knew that, duh. And that can often occur with overconfidence that say, you know, you have overconfidence about a decision you're making. You make the decision and then you come to find out you're wrong. You're like, oh yeah, duh, totally. I knew that. Yeah, that is hindsight bias. I knew that that's how that was going to work out. Duh. Um, then we have belief bias and belief preservation, uh, perseverance. These can also affect our decision making because um, belief bias is the effect that occurs when our own beliefs distort our bias and ability to reason logically. Um, if we are presented any more um, 
information, um, we, we tend to shut that out and our beliefs distort our ability to reason, um, because we can't see past anything, anything past what we would believe anything on the outside is not real or does not pertain to us so that, so we can't use anything outside of our beliefs to solve a problem. Okay. Then we have belief perseverance. This is a tendency to hold on to beliefs, even when we are presented with evidence that refutes our beliefs. And I'm not saying that belief perseverance is right or wrong because sometimes um, it's, it's, it's right to hold on to what we believe um, because we don't know where that, you know, where that evidence is coming from. Not, not everything is, is always what, what it seems, but um if we are handed irrefutable evidence, um, sometimes it's important to know when to let go of certain beliefs that we have um, in order to make a change, in order to make a decision, in order to solve a problem, in order to um, to grow, to learn. Um, so belief bias and belief perseverance can lead us to confirmation bias. This is something I'm sure you've heard of. If not, then I'm sure you're going to hear it um, all the time now. It's something that's big in politics, something that's big in the realm of psychology and science and really lots of areas of life. This is a belief that something is already true and the tendency to therefore look for evidence that proves our beliefs while failing to notice evidence that disproves the, those beliefs. So we're only looking for information that supports our beliefs and that uh, disregards or disproves what we don't believe. So this can affect and influence how we seek information. So uh, we're only going to look at certain sites or look for, listen to certain people. It's going to influence how we interpret information. It's going to make a difference on um, the information that we do receive, uh, how, we, how we take that. And then it's also going to influence how we remember information. So if we have become so inundated with our own beliefs that uh, we refuse to adapt to any new information, we will engage in belief bias, belief perseverance, and confirmation bias. And <laughs> why that is so uh, important to combat, we all we always need to be open to new information and, and changing and adapting to new irrefutable information that we receive. Um, because if not, one, we can be, be believing things that are untrue. We can be spreading misinformation we can be um, we can be the people that that help to hinder progress. Okay, another review. Number one, Maria is telling Lupe that she is going to meet a friend of hers who is a doctor, loves to play golf, and drives a red sports car. Lupe is surprised when Maria's friend shows up and is a female. Lupe has engaged in what type of heuristic? A, representative heuristic. Number two, uh, Reagan frequently hears stories on the news about cars being stolen. In a criminology class, he was asked to guess how frequently vehicles are stolen. According to the availability heuristic, Reagan or Reagan is likely to E, overestimate the frequency. Number three, even when we are presented with information that shows our beliefs to be incorrect, we often find it difficult to abandon these beliefs due to C, belief perseverance. Number four, when we have a strongly held belief, we sometimes seek out information to prove the, the belief while ignoring information that might disprove the belief. What is this phenomenon called? D, confirmation bias. So now on to creativity. Um, we need creativity whenever we are problem solving and making decisions. So creativity is the ability to come up with new ideas that can lead to a particular outcome. Uh, so we have two different types of thinkings when it, thinking when it comes to creativity. Um, convergent thinking is not creative and divergent thinking is creative. So convergent thinking is thinking that occurs when we are confronted with a well-defined, straightforward problem that has a single right or wrong answer. So say we're taking a test, um, you know, a multiple choice question only has 
It's a, it's a well-defined, straightforward problem that has a single right or wrong answer. So multiple choice, fill in the blank, true or false, matching. Those are all, you, you, there's no reason to think creatively. The answer is what the answer is. But if we think of assignments that require divergent thinking, thought process used to generate many different possible solutions to a problem. If we think of some essay questions, yes, there, there are some things that are required. So, so it's, it's kind of a combination of convergent and divergent thinking, but I give full credit to, to people that come from different directions to approach a problem that to approach answering a question. Um, not everyone has to say the exact same thing. There's not always just one exact right answer. So that's why it requires both convergent and divergent thinking. Um, a lot of the journals require mostly divergent thinking because it's a lot of it is opinion-based or experience-based. Um, so that is what happens with um, some of the assignments and tests we have in this class, whether you use convergent or divergent thinking. According to the investment theory of creativity, theory, this is a theory that creative people are able to take ideas that are new or not highly valued and transform them through the process of creativity to become valuable. So this requires six things of people if they are going to be what is called a creative person, someone that can um, come from different perspectives to solve a problem. So number one, you need to have intellectual skills. You need to have the ability to process information well and uh, be able to understand ideas. Two, you need to have knowledge on the topic. Three, thinking styles. You need to have different approaches, whether um, you think about something um, through through um, reading, through orally, through experience, you know, hands-on, but several different thinking styles. Uh, four, the personality. You need to have the right personality to uh, be creative. Number five, you need to have the motivation. It doesn't matter if you don't have the motive. It doesn't matter uh, if you can solve a problem, if you don't have the motivation to solve it. And then number six, uh, you need to be in the right environment, an environment that is conducive to creativity. You don't need people squashing your ideas. You don't need a place that's distracting. You need a place where you can uh, do what you need to do. So the correct environment to be creative. So you need an intellectual skills, knowledge of the topic, different thinking styles, the right personality, you need motivation, and you need the right environment in order to be a creative person. Okay, now on to language structure. So we just got done with all of the ideas of cognition, and now we've got a little bit more to get into language structure. So language is a system of symbols that enables us to communicate our ideas, thoughts, and feelings. Uh, this, you know, we have different, so many different languages across the world, but they are all systems of symbols that enable us to communicate our ideas, thoughts, and feelings with each other. Language can be broken down into phonemes and morphemes. Uh, what are those weird words? Phonemes are the smallest units of sound that are possible in a language, and morphemes are the smallest units of language that have meaning. So let's take the word psychology. For phonemes, um, phonemes would be, for the word psychology, s i a U, O, G, E. So each of those different sounds in the word psychology are phonemes. Morphemes would be psych and ology. Psych has a meaning, which means mind, and ology means the study of. So it's the study of the mind. So that's what morphemes are. Then, uh, in order to understand what people are saying, we require syntax and semantics. Syntax are the rules about how words are to be arranged to form sentences in a given language, and semantics are the meanings of words and sentences in a given language. So, for syntax, um, if I were to say the yellow flower is blooming, well, that makes sense. You know exactly what I'm saying. And, and it, it has the correct structure. The sentence has the correct structure. But if I said the flower yellow blooming is, 
well, that doesn't quite make any sense. We don't say, we don't have uh, the, the noun before the adjective. We have the adjective before that is describing the noun, the yellow flower. We don't say the flower yellow. In other languages, they do. But in, in the English language, we have the, the adjective before the noun. And then we don't say blooming is, we say is blooming, okay? Um, then semantics, sometimes we can have correct syntax, but incorrect semantics. So say this sentence, I'm going to say, it has the correct arrangement of words, but it doesn't make sense. So let's say I were to say, the yellow flower is yelling shortly. Flowers don't yell. And how does something yell shortly? That that sounds like a correct sentence by the way I said it. That is the syntax, but the semantics is not correct. So instead, I should say the yellow flower is blooming beautifully. Okay, that makes sense. That has the correct syntax and semantics. So as you're as you're growing up, as uh as you are in those those early early stages of childhood. So you know your your infancy and toddlerhood. Uh, we have what is called this critical period where we are absorbing language uh, and and are learning language quickly. So according to the critical uh, period hypothesis, we have this limited window of opportunity for children to effectively learn language. So if you don't if you don't start to learn language during that time, then it's going to be very, very difficult for you to learn later on, or maybe impossible. That's why it's so much easier if you want uh, a child to be bilingual or multilingual, that you start introducing them to multiple languages when they are so young, because they have this, this period of rapid, rapid um, neuron production and, uh, rapid mapping of their brains where they can they, they're like a sponge they're rapidly absorbing new information and they can take it on okay so according to the language acquisition device this is the innate ability to learn the rules of grammar in any language and so um this is acquired during the critical period um of of time where you you are absorbing all this information to learn a language uh, children have expressive and receptive language skills, but receptive language skills happens or that's acquired first. So children um, have the ability to understand language before they have they have the ability to communicate with others using that language. So you can tell a child um, to to stay seated there. But before a child can say, I will sit here, they can understand you need to stay seated there okay so receptive language skills they they take on before expressive language skills which is the ability to communicate with others using language so here we see receptive and expressive language skills that happen birth to five years old so um you know when they're when they're little babies they can they can coo and make make sounds um, these are their, and they can smile. So that, that gives us some kind of form of communication, but they can recognize things a lot quicker than, than what they can actually express. So they have to use crying or babbling or banging something or whatever it is in order to communicate that they need attention so they can try to communicate what they want or what they need. When a child first learns how to speak actual words, uh, they engage in telegraphic speech, which is the two word stage of language development in early childhood. So they could can say, I thirsty. They can't say, mom, I am thirsty. I want some water. They can just say, I thirsty. And that gets the, the meaning across that has incorrect syntax, but correct semantics um, because you know what I'm, you know what I'm trying to say, you know what the child is trying to say, you know, maybe a one and a half year old can say, I thirsty. And so you know that they want something to drink, but they can't use correct syntax. They can't use the correct uh, 
the correct language to form a complete sentence in the correct way, but you get the, the meaning comes across. Uh, children go through different uh, through different periods of fast mapping and slow mapping. So fast mapping is the ability to acquire and retain new words or concepts with minimal exposure. Um, and then slow mapping occurs when a new word is acquired through a gradual process that requires repeated exposures. And so one thing I think kids, for some reason, always seem to undergo fast mapping when you say something you don't want them repeating. So you say maybe a bad word and you and the kid automatically knows, oh, that's something I shouldn't be saying. I don't know. I don't know how. I don't know why. But then they start repeating it and you're like, oh, no, don't say that. But for some reason, months later, they can still remember the word and they're saying it. Um, that is a, That is an example of fast mapping, the ability to acquire and retain new words or concepts with minimal exposure. They hear it one time and they're like, what's that? And then they start saying it over and over and over again. Well, they can remember it quickly for whatever reason. So there are areas of the brain that are so, so, so important for the ability to communicate with each other. So we have Broca's area, which is right here in the frontal lobe. And this is the area of the brain in the left frontal lobe associated with the production of speech. So if you have, if you require, if you acquire some sort of brain damage to Broca's area, while you may be able to comprehend language, you can't speak, you can't form words with your mouth. Then we have Wernicke's area. This is the area in the brain in the left temporal lobe, this red part right here, focused on language comprehension. So if you acquire brain damage to there, then you're going to struggle with communication at all because not only will you understand, you also really won't be able to, to speak much. Okay, so going along with the Broca's and Wernicke's areas, um, we have the arcuate fasciculus. This is a tract of nerves connecting Broca's and Wernicke's areas so that when it's damaged, it, it leads to conduction aphasia. Well, what is conduction aphasia? Conduction aphasia is when individuals can understand and produce speech but are unable to repeat words or sentences spoken by other people. And then we have the angular gyrus. This is an area of the brain associated with language that lies between the Wernicke's area and the visual cortex of the occipital lobe that is particularly important in tasks of reading and writing. So of course, um, it's, it's a combination of language comprehension and, and visuals. Well, that's what reading and writing are. So if, if there's damage to, to that area of the brain, then we're gonna have struggle, we're gonna have issues with reading and writing but not necessarily uh, verbal communication. Okay, so uh, this is the last review for chapter seven. Number one, the system of symbols that allows people to communicate through thoughts, ideas, and feelings is called D language. Number two, Larissa is five years old and learning to read. Her parents have her sound out each letter in the word as she is trying to read. Each letter that she sounds out is considered what part of the building blocks of language? C, phonemes. In the English language, adjectives typically come before nouns in a sentence, which is an example of blank. On the other hand, blank refers to the meanings of words and sentences in a given language. B, syntax and then semantics to fill the fill in the blanks. Number four, children are born with a blank or an innate ability to learn the rules of grammar in any language. B, acquired language device. Number five, Jeannie was severely neglected and abused until the age of 13. When she was discovered, she had no language and never fully developed language abilities. This case supports which theory of language development? A, critical period hypothesis. Number six, a baby that has the ability to understand language but not express themselves has developed which type of language skills? A, receptive language skills. Number seven, what area of the brain is associated with the production of speech? D, Broca's area. And number eight, 
blank is located in the left temporal lobe and blank is located in the left frontal lobe. B, Wernicke's area is located in the front temporal lobe and Broca's area is located in the left frontal lobe. Okay, and that is the end of chapter seven.